I'm David Sproles, the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture called Rethinking Luxury at One Hudson Yards. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Andre Kikoski, founder of Andre Kikoski Architect, give us an inside look into one of their recent high-profile New York City projects, a residential tower at Hudson Yards. Andre will explore how luxury is emotional, not transactional, and how he sought to create a tailored environment for the residents of the building. He will walk through the unique materials palette crafted specifically for the building and applied ingeniously throughout its interior spaces. Andre Kikoski Architect is a Manhattan-based architecture and design firm grounded by enduring architectural principles, driven by innovation, and activated by the untapped capabilities of 21st century technology and craftsmanship. I want to know who wrote that for you, because that's awesome. So, um, the firm has completed more than 100 projects working with such renowned entities as the Guggenheim Museum, the Howard Hughes Corporation, the Kohler Companies, and most recently, DHA Capital at 75 Kenmare Street. It is also the recipient of 30 design awards and is featured in more than 800 publications across 27 countries. Andre received his master's degree in architecture at Harvard University. Prior to founding his firm, he trained in the offices of I.M. Pei, Richard Meyer, and Peter Eisenman. He is a trustee of the Van Allen Institute and Alumni Council Emeritus at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Besides being a frequent, frequent lecturer, Andre was recently named one of the top 20 biggest power players in New York City real estate by the New York Post and a top 40 firm in residential design by Interior Design Magazine. I have to say I'm thrilled to have him here, and boy, are we lucky. So I'm going to pass the podium over to Andre. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you uh, for that kind introduction. It's um, really wonderful to be here. I've always thought of the New York School of Interior Design as uh, a jewel in New York's creative community. They produce such great thought and such well-trained graduates. Um, and thank you for reminding me about all those wonderful accolades. We tend to forget them <laughs> in our practice. We're always so busy doing things. And one of the greatest joys is to share our work. And so an opportunity like tonight where we can present work that we've been starting since 2013 to create this environment, uh, and it just finally opened. The final punch list was completed last week. So it's been a long time coming, um, and I'm excited to share it with you. But before I begin, I wanted to thank our amazing office. Uh, we are a really uh, fortunate uh, group to work together. Uh, Liam, Sam, uh, and of course Brian uh, have been really terrific in helping us do all the wonderful things we do. Uh, we also have our tremendous asset, Alex Polier, who helps us organize our thoughts and discuss our work in forums such as this. And also to uh, many of our friends who are here, uh, it's really great to be able to share work in a format like this. So um, I want to walk you through this project. Before I go into it, um, I'll show you a few projects along the way that helped us understand how we think about luxury and what we think it is. Um, but before I do, I just, you know, I, we have been working on this project for five years. Uh, the firm is 18 years old. And we just said at the start of this year, let's just take a minute and think about what we do and why we do it. And we came to a few very simple points philosophically that I just wanted to share with you. Um, most importantly, in the world that we live in today, uh, we think it's really important that we are creating places for people to come together and to create a sense of community. Uh, in the office, uh, we say that we are creating spaces of engagement. Uh, it's also important that we are creating uh, a true sense of place where we are able to activate senses and engage memory uh, and to craft a kind of emotional connection with the environment, the building, the space that you're in, so that there really is a, a true kind of place established. Um, and in a project such as this, uh, where you know, the neighborhood is under construction and in transition, we said we have an added charge to create 
an entire social landscape of an entire neighborhood inside a single building. So we thought those were interesting things to articulate and share. Um, this is the right which unbelievably opened inside the Guggenheim Museum in 2009. Uh, it's a 1,500 square foot space uh, and our, it's representative of one of the smaller scale projects that we do. Uh, what's important about it to us is that uh, it's one of the reasons we were hired at Hudson Yards uh, because they said to us, related said to us, you know, you have this restaurant, it's full of art, uh, it moves with you like the museum and people are interacting with the art in a really meaningful way. It's not that you're sitting there looking at a painting, the art surrounds you. It's literally woven into the fabric of the space. Uh, and we thought it was interesting to be able to say, like, the, the culture is literally woven into the design of the fabric. Um, and it's a more nuanced point as well of our theory of spaces of engagement. Uh, and it's only 1,500 square feet, but the photographer, Peter Aaron, said to me, wow, I could take pictures all day. Every time I turn the corner, there's a new vantage point, which is quite fun. Um, also in this project, we collaborated with Liam Gillick, the contemporary British artist, to create this colorful, site-specific piece of art that you see uh, on walls and ceilings, so it really envelops you. Uh, and the integration of art and architecture, uh, we think, is not only uh, something that's important, we think it's really critical because uh, it enriches so much the experience of the space. It's not about, well, there's a... a Damien Hurst on the wall, I have taste. It's, it's, it's more meaningful. Uh, recently, we started working on a building called 75 Kenmare, uh, which got a lot of attention because the developer also hired Lenny Kravitz to do the interior design. Um, I don't know if he'll follow me to the podium at a later date, uh, but it was pretty fun working with him. Uh, the, the building itself is in Nolita at the convergence of Soho, Noho, Chinatown, the East Village, Little Italy, Little Italy, and the Lower East Side. And we thought this was a really interesting opportunity to uh, create a backdrop of all these intersecting neighborhoods and to try and create a building that was uh, both an icon and disappeared. So we thought to really animate the facade with these beautiful walls of textured concrete with randomly staggered vert vertical channels that are between an inch and a half and three inches wide, but actually go up 60 feet in the air. And it's um, interesting because there's a constantly shifting sense of shade and shadow. Uh, there's an opportunity to look at concrete and say it shouldn't be flat and gray. We can do anything we can imagine with concrete. Uh, so it has a really wonderful scale, uh, and uh, we're excited that if you're walking by the neighborhood and you happen across this, if you're sitting in the park, there's a public park on the right, if you live in the building or not, this is a building that will really participate in the life of the street. It's not a glass building, it's not a traditional formulaic building, it's really carefully crafted. Uh, and I just came back from the concrete casters in Canada Monday, and it's, I think it's going to be really, really beautiful. Um, and then out in the Hamptons, we're um, happy to say some of our guests are from tonight. Um, again, like a beautiful landscape, uh, a really unique place, uh, two hours from the center of the universe, New York City. Uh, so our client came to us and said, I have this wonderful opportunity to do a house. I'm in a flood zone. It needs to be contemporary, and I thought, Perfect, you're in the right place. <laughs> We're really happy to talk to you. And we thought in this house that the opportunity was to celebrate the land, the sea, the vista, to bring the indoor out. Uh, there's a triple height atrium that brings you into the space and the house is actually an upside down house. So from the street, it presents um, a facade that is a little bit more modulated uh, and from the back, it's all structural sliding glass, pocketing doors, it completely disappears. Um, and there's no distinction between inside and outside. Uh, there are landscape living spaces, a glass edge infinity pool, um, and, and, and it's the pure simplicity of it. Our client there said, 
you know, why do I want to look at a wall? I have the most amazing wallpaper outside my window. Um, so, so, you know, the, working at different scales, different types of clients, um, different locations is interesting to us. Uh, and last year at about this time, we were showing a line of cut crystal that we did and cast crystal with Swarovski that we showed at the Milan Design Week uh, as part of their series at Atelier Swarovski where people like Zaha Hadid and Daniel Liebeskind are doing uh, crystal accessories for the home. We thought this is a wonderful opportunity to really do very modest things. The candlesticks are about $100 and the boxes are about 450 they're using some of our favorite materials. The metal is actually a metal that we had developed for the Guggenheim. Uh, and we were looking at a 60s artist, Duane Valentine, who built these beautiful prismatic forms of resin. And we were fascinated by the way that light was moving through these resin prisms. Um, and with the opportunity to work and cast in cast crystal, um, it was really quite fun. Um, so again, like buildings, spaces, objects, houses, like we don't really find a distinction between project types. And I think that also helps us to understand what do people want. If I have an aspirational object that's $100 or a $50 million house, like there's a common desire about how we see luxury. And so that's what we brought into Hudson Yards. So our building um, is 530 West 30th Street, known as One Hudson Yards. It overlooks uh, the main social space of the development. Uh, Hudson Yards is the largest private development in US history. Uh, it is scheduled to go construction through 2025. Uh, and this building is one of the first residential buildings to open. It's 325,000 square feet, uh, 178 apartments, uh, and based on a 1,500 square foot restaurant and a 1,500 square foot apartment that Related had seen of our work, we were hired to do this project, which we loved. Um, there are uh, also 12 amenity spaces inside, about 26,000 square feet, um, which are all about lifestyle, recreation, community, the kinds of things I was articulating at the start of the lecture. Uh, and the spaces are located across city blocks, some subterranean. There are some pieces at the top of the building that I'll show you. But we were really excited because this was an opportunity to bring our work with the Guggenheim, with Swarovski, with developers, with companies that we've worked with as well, like Tiffany and Saks Fifth Avenue, and to try and bring all of that to every experience that a resident could have in this building. Um, maybe that's why it took so long, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, another part that was really exciting, it related said, look, you know, we're doing kind of things that we're known for. Uh, we have a formula that we pursue. And in this building, we want to give you total creative freedom. Uh, our, the head of marketing said our only requirement is that when you finish the building, people look at it and say, wow, we didn't know Related could do something like that, which we thought was great. Uh, and as well, they said, well, let's, let's, let's put some brackets on that. Uh, we need to also challenge you to show us new materials that we've seen, that we've never seen, because we've been building buildings for 30 years, and we know every material out there, so show us things new. Um, so that's where we had this idea of creating an experience that really was a threshold of craftsmanship, of luxury, uh, of detail, of consideration, uh, not necessarily of lavishness, but of thoughtfulness, uh, and not branded with iconic logos, uh, but really trying to create an emotional space for people to inhabit. So I hope you'll agree that that's what we were able to do. Um, so uh, in the introduction, um, it's true. Uh, we, we, we set out to create a unique material palette. So this is a shot of the lobby. 
Uh, we are adjacent to the High Line. It literally goes right in front of our window uh, at the first break. That's the final leg of the High Line. So we not only have the crazy contemporary architecture by all the world's best architects giving us an architectural character of Hudson Yards, but we also have this beautiful organic experience of Hudson Yards, of, excuse me, of the High Line, which if you ask the landscape architect about it, they would say, well, it was overgrown with weeds, so we just curated the weeds. Uh, so, so we thought it was fun. Let's, let's look at uh, organics. Let's look at uh, contemporary geometries. Let's look at materiality. Let's try to integrate art and architecture in a very seamless way. Um, and uh, what you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen are these very thin bronze rods, and behind that is a, a wall of bronze. It's a 25-foot-long foundry cast piece of bronze. Uh, and early on in the process, when we started, uh, and here it is again more in profile, um, we decided to uh, experiment with metals. Uh, we had done some successful experimentation at the Guggenheim. Uh, we did some statuary bronze uh, details in an apartment at One Madison Park. So we went to, we had did one project where we poured bronze over crushed walnut shells. And as the walnut shells um, vaporized, given the heat of the bronze, they popped. And so the surface of the bronze had this beautiful surface quality to it that was dimpled like a, a, a travertine. And we came up with this notion of, of the foundry cast bronze. Related loved it. They said there's this beautiful organic quality. We've never seen this before. Um, so let's use this as the way to start designing the project because the hardest step is always the first step. Writers talk about the difficulty of the blank page. Here we had this tremendous opportunity, this you know, very um, accomplished developer asking us to, to you know, pull out all the stops. Um, it was a little bit intimidating, but uh, the bronze gave us a way in. Uh, and we also decided to complement that with a beautiful piece of glass. Uh, this is actually a piece by our friends at Lasbet in the Czech Republic. Uh, Leon, uh, who is now my good friend and is their president, said, I really want to celebrate the 800-year-old tradition of Bohemian glass blowing, but I want to do it in a totally new way. I want to make it contemporary and cool. Um, and so after three or four design revisions and a visit to the factory, uh, this is what we came up with. And people have compared them to falling leaves, um, birds in flight, <clears throat> that there are all these kind of cool organic references to them as objects and the way they move through the space. So we're very pleased. Um, and the craftsmanship of it was, was quite fun. Uh, we wanted the glass not to be clear, uh, and so when we were at the glass blowing kiln, uh, they showed me, you know, clear and all these different things we could do. And I said, "Well, how do you get the bubbles in there? I love bubbled glass. I've been to Biot in the Riviera." And they said, "It's it's like a trade secret. We can't tell you." And I pressed them a little bit, and they said, "Well, actually, we just take a potato and we throw a potato into the molten glass, and that's what produces the bubbles." Um, like crazy, right? Uh, uh, and, and by the way, uh, Alex knows this story and loves it when I tell it. Uh, I, so I went to the Czech Republic to visit the studio, and a driver picked me up in Prague and like drove me into rural Bohemia, and we pulled up at this little shack where there were goats running around the yard, uh, and I was like, did we get a flat? And they're like, no, we're here. Um, and apparently the company is... Uh, has these two master craftsmen who, like the medieval ages, guard their secrets very carefully in a trade guild. And in the company of, I don't know how many people, only two people know how to do this. So I went to a special, like, um, you know, NCIS type facility <laughs> where we were throwing potatoes in molten glass. Uh, so that was kind of fun. But once the glass is rolled and shaped in the wooden cups, we um, added mica flex to give a little bit more textural quality to it. Uh, so there are gold mica flex and silver mica flex. Some of the sheets have amber inserted into them. Others are clear. 
So with just a few variables, you know, clear or amber or gold or mica, we created a whole vocabulary of shapes. And these craftsmen very carefully uh, blew the glass, tempered it, shaped it, and pulled it by hand to, to create these really exquisite space, uh, pieces, uh, which was quite fun. Uh, and again, you see how they change, a little bit like the Guggenheim at the right, as you move through the space, they change with you. That was important to us. Uh, then there's this beautiful bronze wall that I talked about. Uh, and here it is again. You can see a little bit more of the modeling and the texture to it. It's silicon bronze. And uh, we, at the same time that we were getting into the production of the bronze, Related said to us, we love the building. We think it's going to be really great. Uh, we want you to choose art for the building. So we worked with a fantastic art consultant, uh, Alex de Persia, uh, who's now also a good friend. Uh, and he loved the way that many of the materials that we are showcasing are all about craftsmanship and process. So he wanted us to work with process-driven artists who, who the piece is an expression of the making in the same way that the materiality of the building is. So behind the concierge desk, you see a piece called Instant Gratification by the Belgian artist Michel Francois, who makes his art by throwing molten bronze into water. And he builds these very delicate, it's like when you pick up a leaf in late fall and some of it has fallen apart and deteriorated. There are spaces between where the droplets hit the water and where the bronze grew onto itself. Um, and we said, well, so this is great. Where does he cast these pieces? And like, well, he casts it at Polish Foundry, which is where our wall is from. So we thought that was also a significant moment that you know the surfaces themselves are made by Fine Art Foundry. Uh, Jeff Koons, um, Alexander Calder, uh, uh, even the Oscar statues were all made there. Not necessarily high art, but certainly iconic. Um, and so we went to the foundry, which was really, really fun. Uh, the panels are made with 35-pound uh, bars, ingots, of silicon bronze uh, that are poured into these pink concrete casting beds. And there's a very elaborate way that the bronze flows through the main aperture at the top, through the mold with, like, canals and... Uh, great calculations that only these guys knew how to do. And inside the casting bed, because these panels are only a quarter of an inch thick, uh, there were sheets of linen. And as the linen uh, evaporates, it burns its texture onto the bronze. And the density of how the fabric is gathered also gives us some of the quality uh, of, the, of the bronze itself. Uh, and so you see in the slide on the right, when we take a panel out of this uh, huge casting piece, uh, and that piece, that, that panel hat is roughly 350 pounds, 35 ingots of silicon bronze, uh, and it looked nothing like our control sample. <laughs> and I was a little bit alarmed. And they said, hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, what, what we need to do is we need to go in and wire brush off the ash. Uh, so with a handheld, something a little bit bigger than a toothbrush, you're scraping each panel uh, and then uh, exposing the unburned pieces. And then amazingly, the bronze oxidizes with air and as it oxidizes, it changes color and gets deeper and richer. So you get these beautiful coffees and cognacs and port colors. Um, and we thought, wow, it's not only art, but it's also alive. How, how fun. Um, and I was really, you know, truly grateful to Related that they let us go the distance with things like this bronze wall, which very easily could have been value engineered, or the chandelier. Um, there's even a coffee table in here uh, by Eve Klein and we thought, you know, we have 400 sheets of, 400 pieces of, uh, you know, art glass as our, as our chandelier. Uh, and they said, well, we custom designed the couch. This is an Eileen Gray daybed. Uh, 
that we bought vintage and recovered and reconditioned. There were a couple of contemporary chairs. And the coffee table was, of course, hotly contested. And I was like, guys, there's only one table. It's the Eve Klein table with 3,000 sheets of gold leaf. And surprisingly, our project executive pounded his fist and said, yes, we have to have this coffee table. Um, so you know, how, how great and how fun. And you know, we're really appreciative for that. Uh, so we, we have this color palette of the warm colors uh, of, the, of the cognacs and quartz and chocolates and bronze. Uh, that we mapped into the stones, that we mapped into the, st the wooden millwork around the lobby. Uh, and we said, let's bring this palette into our communal spaces. Let's literally let this single piece of bronze, this 12 by 12 piece of bronze, be the seed of the idea that the whole building is produced from. So this is the concourse lounge. Uh, when we received the project, there was no concourse lounge. It was a bit like a hospital. You got off the elevators and you went to all these different programmatic elements. And we thought, wait a minute, you know, there needs to be a way that people can gather, uh, kind of like an underground piazza, uh, except we don't really want to celebrate the underground part. Um, so it's uh, beautifully appointed, millwork, suede, chiseled stone, all these very sort of nuanced materials um, and some beautiful pieces of art. We have uh, an Annie Leibowitz over at the fireplace. Uh, there's another piece by James Case Leal, a rainbow painting. Um, quite fun, quite beautiful. Um, and people really do use it and gather there. Uh, there's a bowling alley. <coughs> when Related said, uh, you know, there's a component to this, it's a bowling alley party room. Have you done a bowling alley before? Uh, so we thought, let's do, let's do something fun, uh, and we immediately thought of our favorite artist, Jeff Koons, and we said, like, we want to do Jeff Koons bowling balls as a chandelier when you walk in, uh, and we went to Polich, and they said, we can't do that for you because we're, we've signed NDAs on Jeff Koons techniques. Um, but we found another way to replicate it. Uh, there's a quote from The Big Lebowski, the bowling movie, um, oh, you know, strikes and gutters. Uh, ups and downs. Uh, we had a uh, award-winning jewelry designer with exquisite handwriting write it, and then we turned that into neon. Um, and we also wanted each letter to be done individually, not with all the blackout tape. Uh, so it was a bit of a pain to install, but I think it's worth it. Um, and uh, so when you walk in, there's a foosball table, uh, there's a pool table, uh, behind the pool table, which is a vintage piece from the 50s, because we like everything to be kind of mixed up. We don't always like everything from one period, from one manufacturer. It just feels more real to us, more authentic, if, if there's that blend. Uh, so the, the wall behind the pool table are billiard balls. Uh, there are 2,200 of them, and they're mounted on little stems of acrylic. Uh, and at one point, the... Uh, Mill worker said, how do you want the numbers oriented? <laughs> so we came up with a little system, and it was fun. Uh, uh, there's patterning in the floor. There's patterning in the mirrors. There's this very cool um, uh, upholstered wall behind the seating group, uh, hand-created hand panels of blue suede into textures uh, to give shade and shadow. Uh, at one point in the design of the project, I said, you know, Right when we were commissioned for the project in 2013, I had gone on a fishing trip in Sweden, and I loved Stockholm, and I loved the way that the Swedes bring nature in. And it's not too much of a stretch to say that we're trying to reference nature, but in a very New York way. So we went to the furniture fair in Stockholm and brought back these lighting fixtures and a, a bunch of the other pieces as well. Um, so it's not only a mix of periods and countries, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a whole melange. Um, there's a party room, two party rooms at the top of the building. Uh, uh, they are uh, interconnected, um, but can also work separately. Uh, again, the idea of gathering around a hearth seemed warm and intimate to us. Uh, this has a linen acoustic piece over the fireplace uh, to dampen the noise and make it comfortable. 
Um, the, the art, unfortunately, is not in this view, uh, but we have some fun pieces by a Polish artist, uh, Prismic, um, Prismic Prisek, who like, does these beautiful color blocks and then puts an aluminum screen over them that he paints very finely. Uh, Sayer Gomez, who has these exquisite colored canvases, and Matthew Chambers, who tears up his old paintings and weaves them together. And those are hanging just off screen. Um, so I apologize about that. Uh, and of course, the rooms open onto this incredible terrace which is now just below the penthouse of the building. So you're, you know, 320 feet in the air. You can see the Statue of Liberty. You can see, you know, all the way to Lower Manhattan. There's a clear view to the Empire State Building and all the way up to the George Washington Bridge uh, and Grant's tomb. So even in the way that uh, one could live here and on any given day, uh, you know, experience all these different environments, uh, where a lot of thought and care was put into but of them from the selection of the furniture to the detailing, I, th I think that's kind of what we were, we were thinking about and, and trying to create. Uh, there's a swimming pool. Uh, uh, the swimming pool, uh, we went down to the Era Spa in Tribeca uh, as one of the most interesting uh, health amenities in the building, in the city. And we found that they not only had a hot tub uh, and an ice plunge, uh, but also something called a salt float, which is like an oversized bathtub and you hook your feet onto this bar and the water is so salinated that you float. And it's very relaxing and it's not like one of those weird ones where you're in a dark space and they lock you in. Um, and and we, again, we proposed it related, said love to. Uh, so architecturally, we wanted this to have a sense of grandeur. So we have these cascading planes of uh, Turkish marble that are lit uh, linearly. Uh, we worked with Kuli Minato, uh, who are our favorite lighting designers and so, so good. Uh, there are Italian glass mosaics uh, and then these very cool honeycomb textured uh, within the frames, uh, the three frames that you see on the, on the left. Um, and there's a sauna, and we thought, you know, why does a sauna have to look like a sauna? Why can't we create something interesting with the patterning, uh, uh, with the spacing, with the form, and with the lighting? Um, and uh, the workman said to me, like, are you, do you, like, what do you want to do with these colored strips? Because not all the wood is consistently, should I oil them, should I discard them? I said, no, 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 let's just keep it. It looks real, it looks organic. Um, you know, we, we, you know we, we think of luxury as like really being when everything is considered, uh, like everything is right where you want it at the right time for the right purpose. Uh, and here it's, it's a wonderful space to experience. Um, leaving the amenities, uh, we also did everything inside the, in the building, corridors, elevator cabs, apartment interiors. Um, and we thought, uh, you know, really, these should be related. Said this is a rental building, uh, but we want to build it to better than condo level finishes. We have this theory that people want an exquisite place to live, but they don't want to deal with buying. Um, we we in the office call it the culture of convenience. It's the same idea of Spotify, rent the runway, uh, um, uh, you know. Zip car, like why bother owning? It's so much easier just to jump in and jump out when you're done. Uh, so, so custom vanities. Uh, we even thought, uh, you know, let's let's make this better than any private residence we've ever done. And Liam and I were talking in the office, and I was like, you know, I've always wanted to do a plumbing fixture. He's like, yeah, me too. So, uh, so I had met Rachel Kohler at a cocktail party. Uh, and I said to her, can we talk to you about a plumbing fixture for Hudson Yards? She's like, I'll put you in touch with my team. And we met with her team and they said, well, send us some sketches. And we sent them some sketches and basically what you see here is uh, we've captured a little bit of the backlit Oro Cristallo stone that's in the lobby as the feature stone and it's inset in the handles in every master bathroom. Um, and Related loved it, the clients love it, Kohler loved it. Um, we've done now two other projects for them. 
uh, and just yesterday presented a new line of tubs uh, made out of cast bronze. Uh, so it's, it's really fun to be able to do that. And, and it's also a part of collaboration where the companies love getting ideas from outside of their traditional silos and we came with an order in hand. So it was really a, a great experience. And this is now available uh, all over the world with choice of four stones and five metals. And I can't do the math on how many combinations that is, but it's doing pretty well. Um, similarly in the kitchens, uh, you know, beautiful beveled edged stone countertops, no expense was spared. We designed something uh, really carefully with African friquet wood, custom hardware, uh, you know, millwork facing the living room, built-in wine coolers, uh, back painted glass, like linear strips over the upper lights. Uh, you know, just a, a level of consideration that you can't see in a typical rental property um, and related to all of it. Um, so then all of these parts of the building had moved along and last June, uh, we opened our model apartments. Uh, the final scope of our work was creating these environments to uh, help the leasing efforts. So one of the mantras that we have in our office is like we challenge ourselves to create an experience um, that's bigger than square footage. Uh, and this is a 780 square, 718 square foot one bedroom apartment and we thought, let's, like, let's really push it. Uh, Related is a big data-oriented company, uh, and they know who their renters are, what they're like. Uh, they pull all kinds of data um, out of who's leasing and the personality of their buildings, because they've been doing it for so long. Not in any creepy Facebook way, but, <laughs> but in a very purposeful way to make sure that we're on, on point. And they said, this one bedroom is going to be rented by a young urban entrepreneur who's sophisticated New Yorker. He sees his home and where he lives as the physical extension of his business persona. Uh, so we thought, great, let's do something really cool. Let's do a hyper-masculine palette. We have steel gray, we have these deep ocean blues, we have leather chairs, um, you know, and, and really mixed it up. Um, the, Bar stools, for instance, are something we, were, we brought back from Sweden. Uh, they're actually molded, crinkled plywood that are unbelievably comfortable. Uh, next to that are some uh, cantilevered leather chairs on a brass frame. Uh, and there's like a heavy duty hide leather. So again, you're, you're cantilevered in these chairs and they're so, so, so comfortable. Um, and the Swedes, as they would say, uh, were late to industrialize, uh, never really participated in this sort of excess of like Belle Epoque France. So the Swedes have this feeling of like austerity, that when we buy something, we're gonna buy it and we're gonna keep it forever. So in the furniture companies that we dealt with, um, we said to them, we need to make a few tweaks to make it appropriate for New York. Um, and they were entirely receptive um, and that was quite fun as well. It, you know, again, it's this idea of luxury that like we tweaked the finishes of the tabletop to make the top glass to introduce combinations of wood and tones of wood that they wouldn't normally do. Um, and then in the idea of mixing it up, um, mouth blown glass again over the table uh, from a really cool uh, company in Northern Sweden. We found this great 1950s Italian chair at my friend uh, Russ Steele's in East Hampton and then found a tie-dyed velvet uh, that we covered it with. Um, and then we did a custom leather couch. Um, and as we have 12 pieces of amazing art in the building, we have an equal number in the model apartments. Uh, this is Rita Ar Ackerman, uh, who did this beautiful, very gestural piece uh, that we thought would work perfectly in there. Um, and our friends from Lazvit sent us a little crystal skull to put on the table which we thought was really perfect. Um, and uh, I think not only did this unit um, earn the praise of Related, they said it has more swagger per square foot than any other model we've done, uh, but it was the first one to lease up in the building, uh, which was kind of cool. Uh, even the bedroom 
uh, we thought, let's be true to these ideas of, of texture and architecture, and we found this really cool brass bookcase that has no shelves that reminds us of an interesting building. Uh, uh, we repurposed a material we'd found at, uh, that we used at the Guggenheim called Luminoso, uh, which is this walnut, and every quarter of an inch uh, strip of walnut has fiber optics very carefully spaced. It's from Austria, so it's very precisely spaced one after the other. And then we backlit it with LEDs in a blackened frame, and it's um, really quite beautiful and part of the whole appeal. People walked in and like, we'll take it. Um, so that was fun. And then we thought, uh, okay, Oat Bachelor, we got it. Who's our next client? Like your next client is, it's a little bit like a game show, your next client is uh, a family moving from La Jolla. Father worked in biotech as a lawyer, mom was an artist, he's a surfer, she's a ceramicist. Uh, their daughter goes to avenues right down the road and we're like, great, this sounds like fun. Uh, and we thought, well, you know, it's, and they're not, it's not like a posh Upper East Side. Uh, it's not an inexpensive apartment. Uh, it's not a small apartment, but, but it needs to you know, have this feeling. It's what I love about Hudson Yards. Also, it's, it's like free. It's an entirely new neighborhood. There's no tradition there. You know, it's not like you have the storied Upper East Side or the historic Upper West Side. Hudson Yards is like a complete construction of now. So we thought, let's do something that speaks to the freshness of a spring day. Uh, and Charlotte and I were working on this model, and she said, you know, when you walk over to the corner of the room where the building comes to Prow, and you look down, the High Line's right there. She said, why don't we just invite the High Line in? I was like, you mean, like, just bring the colors of early spring into the apartment? And we thought, done, let's do that. So uh, light, crisp tones of early spring vegetation, uh, this beautiful citrine green, um, you know, this quietly gestural uh, rug company, Paul Smith carpet. We're continuing the use of bronze and stone in the coffee table and the custom lamp that we designed in Sweden and brought over. Um, Ethan Cook is the artist of this piece. And again, he tends to weave his own canvas and then he stitches it to a piece of machine made canvas. Uh, to create a horizon line. Uh, I thought they were really beautiful, Rothko-like, just very peaceful and beautiful and perfectly complemented the room. Um, there's a, a fun chair, again, uh, a 70s prober chair uh, that we recovered in this crazy print. Uh, and my favorite part of almost all of this is this like humble little modest window seat that we put in the prow uh, with a pad that actually came from either West Elm or Ikea. Uh, and we found this cool little table for your coffee cup and you know people just walk in and they sit down right there and they sit on their phone and apparently everyone in this line of the apartment uh, you know is is loving this this idea of the bench um, uh, the kitchen uh, again now properly outfitted uh, and I neglected to mention as well uh, the two pieces, because the wife is a ceramicist, we wanted this informal feeling of, of, of uh, movement. Uh, we have two pieces by a really good friend, the very talented artist, John Mosler, who makes these sculptures in his own kiln in Brooklyn on the Gowanus Canal, one black, one white, and together with the Ethan Cook, you know, really have a beautiful presence in the room. Um, really exquisite, and he was very kind to uh, help us secure these for the space. Um, bar cart, love the bar cart. Uh, and again, we thought, you know, they're, they're from California, so we need not one, but two kinds of tequila. <laughs> and, if, and you'll see in the kitchen, um, there's a huge glass jar full of limes and salt. Uh, there's a uh, really nice den in the room, uh, it's a three bedroom apartment. So we said, let's take the den and let's turn it into a TV room. Um, our friends from Fogia, this fantastic Swedish furniture company produced these pieces. Um, and there's an organic table, um, a nice fun lamp that feels almost like from the 50s. Um, 
but is a contemporary piece from Blouse Station in Stockholm. Uh, we even have these little constellation of very simple mirrors on the wall. Uh, and when Arc Digest published uh, the project, they chose this image, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and it, you know, the simplicity, and again, the colors are like the harvest dusk, uh, the color of the night sky, the golden hour in the chair. Um, again, just really, really happy that it's turned out this way. Um, and for the little girl, we said, you know, we can't do the cliched uh, pink princess room. First of all, she's way too cool. She's from La Jolla. Uh, secondly, we d you know, nothing in the building is cliched at all. Uh, everything is a fresh take on material use. Uh, so we found this fun piece by, um, forgive me, James English Leary that I it kind of reminded me of the Bic Pen icon and it, I saw a guy waving uh, and we thought that's a friendly piece for a little girl. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we decided to design a custom bed for her uh, and Charlotte said, what if the bed was hugging you? So the idea for the day bed is that it's like a hug of coral velvet, which I thought was fun. Um, and the uh, chair, uh, another piece that we brought over from uh, Sweden is like, it looks like it's made out of Play-Doh uh, or Frosty the Snowman would sit there. Uh, even the stuffed animals came over from Sweden. So again, like great uh, precision and cohesion in how we looked at it. Uh, the master bedroom, uh, one of my favorite rooms, um, principally because of the Wave 5 seascape painting um, by David Demers, uh, fantastic East Hampton artist uh, and an old friend. Uh, we also have in there, uh, you can see reflected in the mirror, uh, a Eve Fowler painting where she's appropriated a quote from Gertrude, Gertrude Stein saying mood light and darkness, sleep and not sleep. So that's on the wall. Um, and then the coloration of the painting sort of moves out into the space. There's a custom headboard. Uh, it's a tawny oak frame with randomly spaced modules of brass inserts. Uh, again, like we did, we really committed to brass in this building. Uh, and the fabric is a uh, Laura Piana uh, which is really cool. And then as we were looking for bedding, we found this uh, bed covering that recalled the uh, Heatherwick vessel. It has the same geometry as Heatherwick's vessel, which this overlooks. Um, so uh, really happy with how it turned out. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, this master bathroom uh, with the you know, view out into Hudson Yards, covered with mica quartzite, with the custom vanity, uh, with the custom medicine cabinet with shelves, because if you were building this for yourself, you'd love to have little things out and around. Um, and again, marketing has told us that when people walk through, they're like, oh, it's like living in a Four Seasons, only better. Uh, so I think that pretty much covers uh, our thought process. Um, and I'm appreciative to have had the opportunity to walk you through the building. Um, this is, uh, and I, again, I neglected to mention Davis Brody Bond, Steve Davis, uh, so I'm doing it now, uh, gave us this beautifully crafted building which mediates between the brick architecture of West Chelsea mm -hmm. and the um, very contemporary architecture of Hudson Yards. Uh, the, the building presents one volume to Hudson Yards Hudson Yards, but as you look, uh, it's these, these prowl-like corners, these volumes intersecting. It's really quite beautifully done and quite well done. Um, and of, and of course, you see the high line going in front of the building, uh, as I mentioned at the very start. So, um, you know, I guess I would just think about how we looked at this really that we were, we wanted to create a, a, a sort of unprecedented environment. It was very deliberate that we wanted to comfort, uh, dazzle, and connect the people who live there. Um, so if anyone has questions, comments, um, 
now would be a great time. So, please. How much is the rent? Uh, so the one bedrooms start at fifty seven hundred. Uh, the three bedrooms start at ten thousand, uh, and it depends on the floor. But uh, it's the building's fully leased. Um, related was thrilled. Um, so I guess it's the, their, their premise that people want a beautiful environment as if they owned but don't want to bother with buying, closing, renovating uh, is both good news and bad news for architects. But here it's good news. <laughs> yes? Well, Related didn't share any cost with us. Um, they said, just design what you want, and if it's a problem, we'll let you know. Um, and, you know, when our project executive was banging his fist for the $18,000 cocktail table, I did say to Liam at one point, do you think we should have aimed a little higher? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the, every project has compromises in it, but ours were really minimal. Uh, we were trying to do a wall with uh, graphically etched, photographically etched concrete in, the, in one of the cellar lounges. By the way, there's also a children's room, a stretching room, a gym, uh, and a basketball court that I don't have photography of yet to share with you. Uh, but, you know... And instead, we found a decorative painter who used to work with Julian Schnabel who uh, brushed German iron ore onto our wall surface and made it look like some crazy, wonderful stone. And again, that was the default VE. So I know that um, they didn't really spare a lot of expense on it, um, but at least up in record time, uh, related said that part of the reason that they've been successful in the project uh, is because of the pride that we brought to the design process and the finished product. Um, and it, tenants have to value that, uh, but they've rented all the apartments. So, and again, uh, you know, it's Hudson Yards is still a construction site and will be, but when you're in there with the tall ceilings, with the beautiful finishes, with the amazing views, you really are home. Yes. Um, well, the gym is so there's an underground tunnel that connects our building to Abington House. Uh, and Abington House is done by uh, Cloda uh, with public spaces and Bob Stern doing the building. So the gym is actually already in existence in Abington House. So we were given the opportunity to create this very cool corridor that you move through uh, with windows that give you little vignettes into the swimming pool. Uh, and we hung it with very fun Michael Phelan tangram animals because as you're walking through this 12 foot tall corridor, you see these shapes and you're not what, sure what they are. And then you see them frontally and you realize it's a cat, uh, a tangram cat made out of white canvas. Um, and we mixed materials, uh, glass into the pool, had a bit of mesh. So we really tried to make it a beautiful journey over to the gym that was designed. Uh, and then we created a microcosm of, of the concourse lounge as a little seating room over there uh, to, to make it consistent. But the gym was already designed. So. <laughs> so. Anyone else? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, it was a big part of it. Um, you know, the early meetings included uh, the janitorial staff, the building manager. So it wasn't just like, what are we designing that's going to look like beautiful and photograph well, but we own this building. And, you know, the cost of it is amortized over 20 or 30 years. So we really need durable, resilient materials. Uh, so that meant that we were both careful about what we selected and also how we detailed it. At the concierge desk, 
It's a bronze frame, uh, extruded bronze frame, referencing our love for Donald Judd. And then there's a leather padding in it and the face, but the leather padding is set an inch behind the edge of the bronze. So people won't scratch it going by with a cart. It's lots of little details like that that allowed us to have a really beautiful palette, but not have to compromise. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and one, uh, one other change that we made was we had a lot of Venetian plaster all over the building um, and Related said, isn't there just like a wallpaper that we can do that looks like Venetian plaster? Um, and um, I've been friends with Laura Romanoff forever of the My Romanoff Company and we had a lot of conversations uh, and so we actually developed a wallpaper uh, we also developed a carpet for the corridors um, that was quite fun uh, and I think that's going to launch next year. Um, so we not only used the, the limitations of dealing with durability uh, as a, a way to consider the design to make it better, uh, but we also took it as an opportunity to say how can we create things that aren't out there. You know, plumbing fixtures set with stone, beautiful wall coverings that if someone does ram a cart into it, rather than redo the whole wall at $50 a square foot, just change the wallpaper. So it's been a really winning strategy for both the users as well as the building maintenance as well as us. So, yes? Have you done other related spaces? Um, this is the first one. Uh, it took five years. Uh, so... We'd love to do another one. I guess we better hurry. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes. I don't know a lot about uh, the leasing options. I think uh, most people do a one-year or two-year lease. Uh, Again, it's, it's, that's the whole vision that Related had. Like, you don't have to commit here, right? That's the whole thing about the culture of convenience. You know, if you... Yeah, they're all, they're all empty, but, but a number of people have said, oh, I love the three bedroom, can you do mine? Can you give me exactly those pieces? Um, and then the next question is, can it happen by the end of the week? <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, it's the limit of the culture of convenience, or the downside. Anyone else? Yes. How many different products were created that we now come in for plumbing fixtures besides the plumbing fixtures? We did plumbing fixtures, wall covering, uh, carpet. Uh, we, based on the uh, collaborations that we had with LASVIT, uh, we're meeting them uh, next week to talk about some potential other ideas. Uh, Kohler, as I mentioned, we're doing a line of uh, tubs and sinks with them. Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, but look, we came to them and we're like, we love what you have, but we need something very specific, and it doesn't exist in the marketplace because this is like a special opportunity. And, you know, Kohler's R&D team are all out in Milwaukee, in Kohler, Wisconsin. So the idea of setting translucent Brazilian stone into faucets had not occurred to them. Uh, right? I mean, with all due respect to Milwaukee. Uh, uh, ditto my Romanoff. Um, and so we bring, you know, we, whether we're dealing with vinyl or glass or bronze, uh, it's, it's how the lecture started. We want to figure out how can, we, how can we create something? How can we reference hand techniques? How can we use new technology to laser cut the stone that we could fit in because you can't really like, chisel it? Um, and it's, it's really fascinating because there's, uh, you know, it, like, it works on so many levels. Um, so, I mean, at the Guggenheim, we did a chair that Lini Rosé put into production. That gave us a little test of it, a little taste as well. So um, why not? And uh, uh, we talked with one company who saw our, our, all of our custom headboards, and they're like, wow, these are really fun. We don't have any headboards in our line. 
So, um, but it's, it's like, you know, we're just trying to fill a need and solve a problem. So, yeah. So, would anyone have another question? You've been very patient while I ramble on. I just feel like I worked on it for five years. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.